Well, we're not going to occupy these chairs because three of them will be occupied by very special people who've been brought together actually originally by these two men. And Peter, how did it begin? Was it your idea or his idea? Well, I, I came to Richard with a proposal and it sort of evolved uh, from, from there. And uh, What was the proposal? Well, I think there was a, a dream that uh, trust in institutions um, was failing in all sorts of areas and yet there were still individuals uh, who through extraordinary lives had the trust and faith of a lot of the people of the world and uh, that perhaps there was some way of, of uh, getting some sort of organization which might put together some of the wisdom and experience and be able to influence things. Um, and the linchpin <coughs> was to be... Um, well, I, I, I felt that, um, uh, that, uh, that having a group of people that could uh, deal with conflict resolution issues, um, who, who had uh, high moral authority, um, uh, would have a chance of resolving, resolving these issues. Um, we have organizations like Sandhurst and you know, a lot of military organizations, um, but there, there are very few, few organizations that are out there trying to deal with peace and reconciliation. So you obviously have to get, I mean, I don't know how many world leaders you know. You probably know loads because you fly all over the place and have to get permission. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, but, I mean, it's one thing to have an idea. It's quite another to try and persuade people of presumably large ego and large previous power to get on and join. Well, we both agreed that we had to get Mandela because if, if the idea was that people without political, military, or economic power, but just moral authority, uh, he was the number one target. So I think our discussions began in 99 and, and we actually got to sit down with Mandela in 2001 and it, it then took a few more years. He, he was initially not very convinced. Uh, he said, I'm not sure that the world wants a bunch of old timers getting in the way. But then he remembered when he was negotiating with Hutus and Tutsis, and the young generals involved said, we want to negotiate only with you, because everyone else seems to have an agenda. Uh, you only seem to want the, the best outcome for all of us. And at, at that point, we started to get hopeful. And uh, you know, Richard is, is brilliant at moving those things along. Um, and, and Gradually, I think he became convinced. So you, you had Mandela as a yes, but there are 10 of them. So, and and you've got to get 10 people who fancied working together. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, uh, it, it was incredible sort of sitting down with Mandela and Grasha Michelle. And obviously, it was extremely important that the elders were chosen, um, uh, chosen by them. Um, previous to that, um, uh, President Carter, uh, Desmond Tutu, and others had come to Necker Island. There had been a lot of people in this room uh, who'd met on Necker Island um, to brain, brainstorm about um, uh, you know, what kind of elders there should be, um, you know, how one could get a, a, a gender balance, uh, a, a global balance. Um, and so by the time um, Mandela and Grasha Michelle sat down to try to choose you know, who were the you know, 12 um, most respected people in the world, um, Anyway, a lot of groundwork had gone in. But, but rather was... gloriously, one of them was Aung San Suu Kyi, and she's now had to um, recuse herself because she's now in power. I mean, she's elected. Yeah, I mean, it was just wonderful to see what's happened in Burma. It hasn't gone, um, or, or sorry, in Myanmar, hasn't gone the whole way, but it's, um, it's, it's been a fantastic step in the right direction. So what would you say was the greatest thing these elders have achieved? Would, would you say the independence of South Sudan? Um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of things that have been achieved, um, sometimes as individual elders, sometimes as elders. Um, you know, you had Kenya falling apart. Um, you had um, uh, Archbishop Tutu, um, Grasha Michel, and, and uh, Kofi Annan playing a, a big role in, in making sure that uh, a coalition government got formed. Uh, and anyway, you'll, you'll be talking to them, but there's been an, an awful lot of things they've been doing. And I, well, I'd just say looking forward, I think there's extraordinary opportunities and the first time that uh, with technology and communications revolution, you know, you're just beginning to see in the Middle East the impact of, of uh, digital phones uh, un universally spread around and in a sense you can imagine a world where anything bad that happens is mapped. You know, organizations like Oshahidi doing that with uh, storytelling so you can zoom in and hear in hmm. people's voices with 
big global campaigns built up, people like Avars doing that, and then uh, high-level interventions. And this is where the elders could play. So, you know, I'm passionate that the possibilities of the technological revolution, when allied to this, uh, could achieve a lot more. And it may be just incremental, but if they just stop one war, then that would be... Uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. Well, look, uh, I know that they wouldn't even be here without you and a group of people who actually fund them. Because they've, exactly. got to, they've got to move from A to B and B and B and B and A and all the rest of it. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> folks, and to all those folks, folks a big here, hand for uh, Richard Branson and Peter Gabriel. Thank you very much. So let's hear now from the elders themselves, President Carter, Archbishop Tutu, and former President Mary Robinson, all three coming on. So we've heard how it, how it began, but you know, it's all very well sort of lining up some incredibly you know, experienced people, but you've all got, in the nicest possible way, big egos. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> and um, uh, you've got to work together. And uh, you know, um, Archbishop, former president, former president, how, how, how do you work together? These are fantastic people, actually, uh, that you have former heads of state uh, dancing attendance and listening to a mere archbishop. I mean, that's fantastic. The, the most unknown <laughs> oh, archbishop in, these, in the world. No, no, but I mean, they really are uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, yeah, the alchemy has been good, mm. uh, you know, but we, we had to learn to fit, uh, to, you know, know, know that I'm very strict about time. Ah, that's good to know, yeah. because people say you go on a bit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I is, thought is, you were going to be nice to me. <laughs> He's also quite bossy, I have to say. Quite bossy. <laughs> In fact, he enjoys bossing people. Come, comes with the cloth. Yes. Yeah. But I, I think it's true that when we, when we started, we were more aware of what we had done and you know what we hope to do as individuals and then I think very quickly and um, with a lot of help and guidance from our chair uh, we began to see that as elders together yeah. we could do so much more and I think it helps I mean I, I, I think it helps that we have a moment of silence at the beginning of each of our meetings so we're not a think tank in the yeah. In the a secular sense. moment. Um, it can be a secular or a spiritual moment. It's obviously a spiritual moment when it ends with Arch, you know, he always ends it um, in prayer. But the moment can be shared as, as, as a moment. But it's, it, it, it's, 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 even on teleconferences, we go silent, which I think you shouldn't do on a teleconference, but we do <laughs> at the beginning of it. <laughs> uh, do you ever disagree, President Carter? We disagree quite often, but less now than we did at first. I would say that we've learned to know each other. We've uh, kind of uh, accommodated the idiosyncrasies of these other people who, uh, <laughs> who, you know, who don't always see things the way they should be, the way I see them. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we've also seen that there's strength in harmony. And so we very seldom have a contrary vote. Almost always when we have a difficult decision, Sometimes we put it aside and say, we can't do that. But when we do make a decision, it's always by consensus. Hmm. And we frequently go back to what Nelson Mandela told us at the inaugural ceremony. Yeah. And so now I think that we see that although none of us are involved in politics, we don't get involved in the debates in the United Nations you know, Security Council. So basically the elders, uh, we go where we want to, we meet with whom we choose, and we say what we really believe without any fear that we'll be voted out of office because we've already been uh, <laughs> <laughs> out of office. How, 
How often does somebody say they don't want to see you? Oh, uh, um, uh, politicians, uh, political leaders. Yeah. Uh, hardly, who's, who's turned you down? Ha, ha, hardly ever. Really? Imagine, imagine uh, uh, Jimmy Carter picking up the phone and saying to a head of state, uh, we would like to meet you. No. no. <laughs> Hardly ever. I mean, I think, mm, uh, and, and people are beginning to be aware that we, we, we are not into twisting arms. Mm. I might obviously promise uh, them heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Never help. No, no. Never help. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if they don't op cooperate, then of course they will go to the warmer Other place. place. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, President Carter, it, it, it would be good just to look at, at an example of, of where you have worked as elders. And, and I think Sudan is a, I mean, after all, you, you came of age as elders. Uh, at the time of the beginning of Darfur. Yes. Um, could you just, you've just been in Sudan, you've even been talking to President Bashir, who is somebody to whom neither we, the Brits, nor the Americans will speak to because there's an arrest warrant out for him. Well, our first trip to Sudan with a fairly large group of elders was to Darfur. We went into the desert area, we met with the people who were there, who were suffering. We also met with President Bashir and with those involved in causing the suffering. And since then, we've seen uh, votes in southern Sudan and a formation of the newest nation on earth. But still, there's a very serious threat of war. It's probably one of the most serious threats of international war there is in the world now between South Sudan, a, a nation, and, and North Sudan. So uh, when I, when uh, Lakhda Brahimi and I finished uh, witnessing the first presidential election in Egypt, we went to Sudan and we met with al-Bashir. And I was asked also to go by my own country's government who refuses to meet with al-Bashir because he's been indicted by the International Criminal Court. And so we, we, following that, I called President Salva Kiir in the South to tell him that I wasn't discriminating against him. And now, immediately after this meeting, a group of elders are going to go to the southern part of Sudan to meet with President Salva Kiir, and I will probably call Al-Bashir to say we're not ignoring you because we couldn't go to both places at once. So we're trying to prevent a war from taking place there and still working with the United Nations, with the United States, and, and with the African Union and the Arab League to try to keep a war coming. What, what do you think you were able to, to extract from President Bashir in terms of an understanding that there wouldn't be? War? Well, one of the key places in, in Sudan is Abyei. Abia is a tiny part of, a, of a, right on the border of this, this in is the dispute. Oil That's center. where a major part of the oil is. So I gave uh, President uh, Bashir two or three requests. Uh, I think there were five or six, as a matter of fact. And, and one of my requests was that he withdraw his troops from Abia, which the South Sudan had already done. And while uh, Lakhda Rahimi and I were sitting there, he said, I will do that. And he did. So that's just one tiny step toward a possibility of peace, but I don't think that if it had not been for the elders... So there's a demilitarized zone which wouldn't exist were it not for your intervention? Well, I wouldn't give it... Uh, because a lot of people are working on it, but, sure. but, but the point is we requested that and he agreed and, and we were able to announce it to the press immediately afterwards. And which, where do you, where which do you... I to be modest. <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I don't always do. Uh, <laughs> but, but where do you go from there? Because... Um, somebody has to sustain that situation. That's, that's true. Well, we have a lot of projects in North and South Sudan in the health field, but, but immediately after this, a, a group of elders will be going to Juba in the South to meet with Salva Kiir, the new president of a brand new nation. So we'll continue to use our influence whenever an opening occurs to help bring an end of that uh, potential conflict. Would you say that the elders played a part in preventing Kenya falling into total civil war? We didn't go as elders. I mean, we were not wearing the elders' cap, but we, we were each invited coffee, uh, Grasha Marcel. I was invited because I'd been uh, president of the All Africa Conference of Churches and was invited by the churches to come and help. But th this, yeah. I, I should explain to the audience, was at the time when a thousand people had been killed in, yeah. in Indonesia warfare. 
um, between different uh, tribal groups, mm. and there was the real danger that a yeah. civil war yeah. that's been in the making for half a century would flare into total bloodshed. Yes, and, and I think, I mean, the fact that Coffee could uh, give so much of his time, uh, they certainly, I think, helped to diffuse a very, very serious situation, and, and, and Grasha's being there as well. Well, uh, yeah. we're going to come back to Africa because there's a lot to talk about, not least the appalling bloodshed between uh, Islamists and Christians, which is occurring in both Kenya and yes. more particularly in Nigeria, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, I wanted to move to a different part of the world because we're right on the heels of a presidential election in Mexico. Yes. And one of the distinguishing factors about this particular election is that the man who's won it is absolutely implacably opposed to the war on drugs. Uh, and he's not alone. Um, where are we with drugs and the elders? I mean, where, where, do you have a collective view on... <laughs> no. I'll rephrase that. I'll... <laughs> I'll rephrase that. Um, do, you, do you have a view on the decriminalization of drugs? We haven't um, addressed it collectively as elders, but one of our group, um, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the former president of Brazil, has been leading um, a very important initiative on this issue in Latin America, but actually globally. And I, I was with him in Rio, and apart from the issues of sustainability we were talking about, you know, young people were coming up and meeting him, and he's a hero in that whole region because of the work he's been doing in that area. And it has been discussed informally. We haven't taken a position on it, but I know that President Carter took a very early position on yeah. that issue. Well, we've all been trying to help President Cardoso explain the issues involved in the decriminalization of marijuana, for instance. And uh, it just happens that when I was President of the United States a little more than 30 years ago, I called for the decriminalization of marijuana. Uh, not, not the legalization. That must have won you a lot more friends than well, you had to begin with. As a matter of fact, it was not an unpopular issue because then we were talking about treatment of drug addicts and doing away with the drug on the consumer end. But, but since then, there's been a massive move toward concentrating almost exclusively on doing away with the suppliers, with helicopters, with bombs, with, with uh, military action and so forth. And I think what President Cardoso says, with which I agree, is that we need to stop putting young people in prison that have a small amount of marijuana and let them be treated if they're addicts and, and concentrate on the treatment and the consumers instead of just concentrating on people in the South Hemisphere who produce uh, drugs, particularly marijuana. But, and I think that uh, this issue in Mexico has been emphasized by the, by the incumbent president now who sent massive numbers of troops into Mexico, which has caused I think so far um, over 12,000 deaths. Of the three of you, you are the one that lives in the south. What's your perspective looking north at the consumer? Although you have consumers in South Africa too, as you've already illustrated. <laughs> well, you seem to... <laughs> yes, I, I haven't given a great deal of thought to this. I mean, I, I go along with uh, um, our friends, I mean, that you do everything you can to be preventive, uh, you know. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I, I, would, I would say... It's not often that I find that you've not given a lot of thought to something. I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking of the contrast between uh, people who get locked up for uh, perhaps peddling a bit of marijuana mm. or uh, being caught with it in their possession and a banker that's been, um, well, named for... Um, uh, lying or deceit or whatever else that they get up to. They don't go to jail, but the, but the criminalization yes. of drugs ensures that some of the most vulnerable people end up in the nick. Yes, I, I, I think uh, we... Ours is a thoroughly unequal world. And it, it, it seems so obvious that uh, instability is going to be a consequence of that. I mean, this is a particular example. But I mean, you can show it in so many different areas. I mean, when you, when you, you get a, uh, Occupy Wall Street um, and, and all of the demonstrations that we've had in developed countries, 
people are saying this is unconscionable uh, and, and it is something that is not sustainable. Hmm. I mean, that we are going to have to begin looking at trying to make our societies a great deal more egalitarian. One of the things that we, we were discussing this particular issue when one of us, uh, uh, Matija Tisari, former president of uh, Finland, said one of the reasons why you've had less turmoil in, in the Nordic countries is that they are actually, a, or they've always been a great deal more egalitarian. Uh, that you walk in the streets and you don't see poor people. Uh, President Kaja had a, a crack drip uh, and, 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 and it got a little painful even for him. And he went to the hospital. Uh, after the treatment, he, he, he was producing his uh, card and they said, not in no way, hmm. you know. Uh, you and, for nothing. Well, the, the taxes are quite high. Hmm. Isn't it 70%? Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. So one, one of the consequences of, uh, of the use of marijuana is that when I uh, became president, of a thousand people in America, one was in prison. Now, over seven are in prison out of every thousand. Primarily because young people have been put in prison just because of, of the possession of marijuana. So that's, there's an argument on both sides. But Cardoza and many others in the South, particularly in Latin America, are prepared to talk about it. Yes. Nobody in the North seems to be prepared to talk about it. The Portuguese apparently have done something quite they imaginative. Have. Mm. They have. Yeah. They have. But they, generally they. speaking, you don't mm. find leaders saying, we'll decriminalize. That's exactly right. And, and most of the people that, that are in prison in America are, are very young people, they're minorities, they're extremely poor, or they're mentally ill. Those are the ones that go to prison. The rich white people very rarely go to prison. They have good lawyers. Now, each of you has been to a very interesting part of the world uh, in the last few days. You've been in Egypt, and you've been in Rio. I'm going to come to Rio in a moment, but let's, let's just look at Egypt. Um, you raise your eyebrows, yeah. but you presumably were <laughs> relieved yes. that, that, that the... Uh, Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood. Well, I, that's not, I was relieved because the Egyptian people had, had two honest and fair elections for president, 13 candidates at first, and then two candidates, and in both cases, uh, Morsi won. And, uh, and he has now been inaugurated as the president of Egypt. But my position is that when the people do have an honest, fair, open, safe election, the rest of the world should support whoever's elected. Mm -hmm. And now there's still a doubt in my mind about what's going to happen in Washington, what's going to happen in London, what's going to happen in Paris about accepting a leader, a former leader of the Muslim Brotherhood as president of Egypt, even though the people in Egypt, 90% of whom are Muslims, have chosen their own person. So I just feel that, that we need to ad mm. adhere to not only I, I wondered, basic human rights, but the democracy. I found a thought crossing my mind as I was uh, watching this play out, but from a distance. Yeah. And that was whether uh, Washington, being the biggest aid donor to Egypt and the biggest supplier of military equipment, might have whispered down the telephone, honor the vote of the people. But I wonder whether that might be a bridge too far. I think if the United States had expressed its public opinion, it would have been a negative factor in Egypt. I don't think that the Egyptian people were amenable. Well, I, thought, I thought more likely they would be talking to the generals they know I from hope their they previous... Will. And so far, I think President Obama has been quite wise in saying we will support the results of a democratic election. And uh, I don't know what's happening in the background, but my hope is that we will not support the generals, but we will support yeah. democracy and freedom in Egypt. One of the things which struck me, I was in Tahrir Square for the first two weeks, and um, I fully expected to find anti-American slogans, uh, anti-Israeli slogans, and pro-Palestinian slogans. Yeah. There wasn't a single outside slogan of any description. It was a completely mm. Egyptian mm. event. And what was also fascinating was that the people seemed to recognize that this country, which languishes at about 95th in the world and is capable of being 18th in the world, yeah. longed to be there. Mm. I think so. Mm. Are you optimistic then? I am. You I'm are? Yeah. Ten-year odyssey or tomorrow? I'm optimistic at this very point. 
but I think my optimism is based on the objectivity of the, of the world leaders in the West who would have to accept the proposition that a Muslim Brotherhood uh, leader has now been chosen president. I think we should accept that fact, but I think that's the uncertainty of it. Now, amid the absence of Ms. Brintland, mm. I decided to wear green socks, not, not in honor of Ireland, <laughs> uh, and a green tie in honor of Rio plus 20, mm. which you were present at. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing uh, I'd like to suggest to you is that the media and even the political classes seem to have lost faith with the Rio process, with Kyoto, mm. with mm. the whole thing. I mean, I, I again was at Copenhagen mm. when that conference yeah. collapsed, and mm. it, it detonated the media's interest. Yeah. They absolutely mm. said, well, that's it. We mm. got this far mm. and it all fell apart. Yeah. What was the feeling in Rio? There was a kind of paradox in Rio. I, I'm also very sorry that Gru isn't here because mm. she was the heroine of Rio, the mother of sustainable development, and she spoke beautifully at a, a huge number of events and um, was very much a focus of young people. They wanted to meet this Gru Brundtland of the Brundtland Commission. It was wonderful. And we had young girls that we were debating with that I could come back to. But what happened was... I think a sort of fear of a repeat of Copenhagen for exactly the reason you said. So the Brazilians put a great deal of pressure on to have a weak agreement and to have it before the heads of state and government came and even before many of the ministers came. So you had had a, a weak agreement wrapped up with um, some commitment, importantly, to sustainable development goals and a commitment to a high-level political forum, um, you know, a process for that, but without being clear. But it uh, went backwards on things like reproductive rights, backwards on Cairo, the Cairo conference and the Beijing conference. And it was full of you know, aspirational language, but not really commitments. But what happened was um, all the, uh, those who had come with hopes that um, there would be a kind of sense of a generational moment in Rio, like Rio, plus 20, uh, Rio 20 years ago, that there would be a change of direction which the world needs on sustainable development. And they were so... Uh, outraged at this weak agreement before the leaders came and the leaders didn't reopen it, they just made speeches, they did nothing, um, that there was a sort of energy of saying, we can't leave it to these political leaders, they don't seem to get it. And from indigenous to NGOs to business to philanthropy to um, the, the many, many um, uh, public-private partnerships and broad um, partnerships that were being forged, there was a sort of sense that maybe we need a coalition of the willing to change the whole debate on energy, on climate, and on the future of the world, the future of the Earth itself. And that very broad consensus kind of energized people. So even though they were furious with the political leaders, they weren't, dis they weren't sort of down and without energy. They were sort of more energized. And I think that that is the mood that has come out of Rio. Well, well as a journalist, I've begun to look at um, what corporations are doing, and, mm. and multinationals in particular. And I'm very struck by Unilever for example. And, and not Unilever alone, though Unilever has given leadership. There, there were very significant commitments made. They, because, they yep. seem to be setting mm. individual corporate mm. tar targets for actually 40%, mm. 60%, 80% mm. sustainability mm. of power yeah. and all sorts of other things. And also countries like Mexico, you mentioned it in the context of drugs. I would mention it for its leadership on climate change and its green fund and its focus on green jobs and trying to get jobs for young people. I actually went to Los Cabos um, where the G20 was meeting before I went to Rio. So I have a very bad footprint at the moment, <laughs> carbon footprint. But um, Mexico is one of the countries and there are other um, interesting countries giving real leadership. Um, you know, countries like Costa Rica um, has a really good, um, Rwanda, um, you know, uh, uh, countries that really are stepping up to the plate in, in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. But the whole um, system of the 190 plus countries is not working well on this because a few countries can undermine getting an agreement and I'm afraid the United States is yeah. not to the forefront on this issue. Well, the issue of uh, global warming, which I think is mm -hmm. a crucial issue, mm -hmm. was basically ignored even by the planners of Rio plus 20. I mean, it never was in the forefront because it's kind of a despairing feeling that only Europe is really committed to doing something about global warming. Well, and even our commitment is. <clears throat> I think it's um, affected by the Eurozone and the whole financial crisis. Yes, I, 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 I just wonder, I mean, about all of us, uh, that we, we seem to think that there is a fallback position. Yeah, exactly. Uh, globalists, 
we'll have another world. Mm. And you've got to remind people, <laughs> if we mess up this one, yeah. there's no other world. Mm. We're done for. Uh, and, 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 and I don't know <coughs> when we are going to get it. And that's why intelligent media should not be ignoring it, as, mm -hmm. we, as I said to you in conversation some time ago. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but we, we, I just have to tell you, we did have a wonderful um, interaction before we got to Rio, the elders, with youngers, with mm -hmm. four youngers, um, Esther from Nigeria, Marvin, a 23-year-old from China, fantastic. They were all fantastic. Um, Sara from Sweden, who was working in UNEP in, in Nairobi, and Pedro from Brazil. And you should have seen Pedro and Fernando Henrique Cardozo, the former president of the country, speaking, not just speaking with Pedro, but Pedro was sending this out on social media that uh -huh. we elders are not good enough at. And similarly, Esther was... I was going to ask, is was, it on was, YouTube? Oh, of course it is. Yeah. And, and it's, on, uh, you know, it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter, because these young people were getting the message out. And, but also, what they had to say themselves. They were really remarkable. I mean, just being with them and listening to their commitment and their determination and their connectedness, you know, it was very encouraging. But I, I want to go to a challenge which um, everybody in this hall is horribly aware of and which we feel completely powerless to do anything about, and yet we see the images of carnage every night, and that is Syria, yes. which one of your number has recused himself from your... Um, he's not an elder at the moment, but he'll come back, but Kofi Annan is there mm. trying very hard to get something moving. Um, do you talk about Syria as yes. elders? Yes. yes, with Kofi Annan and also among ourselves, yes. Mm. And uh, that's one of the areas that I know that uh, Arch particularly wanted to get involved in much earlier. Mm. Um, and we still see a, a disparity between the, the um, permanent members of the Security Council where Russia and China don't agree with the other three uh, members. And uh, my, own, my own hope is that Kofi will be successful in implementing his six points. We're all backing Kofi Annan's proposals, by the way and that there can be eventually uh, an honest election in Syria to let the Syrian people choose their own president, their own parliamentary members. The difference, though, is whether Assad has to step down first, which the United States and, and Great Britain and, 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 uh, and France won't, or whether the people will decide whether Assad steps down. That's what Russia and China want. Hmm. And that issue has not been resolved. And the, the fascinating thing is that the Christians are actually with Assad. Yes, the Christians are very right. afraid right. of what's going to happen yeah. if Assad falls, because for 40 years, Bashar al-Assad and his, and his father, uh, Hafez al-Assad, have protected the Christians and all the minorities in Syria. And they don't know what's going to happen if they fall. I mean, one of the things which, which it's very hard to uh, perhaps comprehend is that this is one of the most beautiful countries on earth, yeah. and that it is one of the least spoiled in the Arab world. And in the past, it's had the most uh, harmonious relationship among Jews, Christians, uh, Muslims of different kinds. It, it's been a, a very good melting pot where people lived in harmony with each other until but recently. Do you now read it as a conflict in part that is between Sunni and Shia interests? There's, there's no doubt about that. It's Iran against uh, Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Qatar and Russia. That's exactly where the major issue is. Mm. And of course, the Christians and others are a very tiny minority. You see, when the West says get rid of Assad, do they know that whoever comes after Assad from the Alawite section will be something much worse even than Assad? I think that's what Kofi has been trying to deal with, is, is what's going to happen and how you can have a harmonious transfer. Assad has called for elections in 2014. But what the United States has insisted upon, even six months ago, is that he stepped down first, which uh, has always been an almost impossible demand. I mean, I think one has to look back to the Balkans to remember any, any scenario in which mm. people have felt so helpless looking in. Yes. There was, of course, intervention in Bosnia. But there's not been intervention in Syria, and nobody really of any weight is urging it either. No. In fact, most people of any intelligence are urging it not to happen. Um, 
But don't you feel a sense of powerlessness looking no. at Syria? No. Uh, no. Uh, well, yes and no. The, the, the thing that we, we said we could usefully do as, as elders, uh, I mean, if you imagined that we lived in a, in a village, this is the global village and we are elders, and we say it is unconscionable, unacceptable mm. that you should have this courage. And, and we're speaking to all sides and saying, for goodness sake, uh, recognize the humanity of the other. Because, as we say, a person is a person through other persons. My humanity is caught up in your humanity. And when you dehumanize that other, whether you like it or not, inexorably, you are doing that to yourself. And, and, and so we could, we tried to have that voice and say, look at what you are doing to yourselves. For goodness sake, please. Now, I don't know whether anybody listened. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that the statement is yeah. made. It, it, it's also, I think, um, uh, important that the elders look at these very difficult situations. And we do mm -hmm. agonize, particularly recently on Syria. Yeah. But we also um, have areas, I mean, Arch mentioned inequality. And from the very beginning, the inequality um, in our world of girls and women and the role of religion and tradition mm -hmm. in subjugating women um, brought us to a, a, what I think is a, a very a remarkable opportunity for a global partnership on child marriage. Mm -hmm. And um, a number of us and, uh, with Arch um, in each instance have been to Ethiopia and to India yes. um, to um, look at the situation. I think when we first decided that we would engage on child marriage, because it's a difficult issue, marriage mm -hmm. is not a purely private no. um, uh, circumstance, but the fact that girls can marry at eight, nine, ten, when we were in Ethiopia, and the same thing in Bihar in India, the average marriage age was 12. And we were meeting these wonderful young Indian girls who were negotiating with their parents to stay in school another year or so. And, um, you know, in fact, what we were doing was supporting the villages where there were projects to address child marriage, because that's the way it has to be, bottom up. And in both Ethiopia, the, the marriage law was fine. Um, neither uh, um, the boys or girls shouldn't marry before 18. In India, it was even stricter. Girls not before 18, boys not before 21, at the federal level. But in the state of Bihar, the average age was 12. Mm -hmm. The fact that the elders became engaged and um, uh, Mabel van Orange and her team were um, uh, bringing together those who were working on child marriage in different parts, but they felt very lonely, they felt isolated. Mm -hmm. And gradually they realized it would be possible to have linkages made between those working in um, South Asia and Africa and Latin America on this issue and bring them together. So we now have this global partnership, Girls Not Brides, um, more than 100 organizations. It's now financed by um, uh, philanthropic support from different foundations and has its own um, uh, coordinator and staff and will be hived off, really, from the elders. But it, it's been a, um, one of those examples of taking a particular issue um, and we need to look, look more at the adolescent girl. We need to do other ways in which we can support and the role of men. And this is where having male elders very strongly on this issue is a huge advantage. But if you measured Syria, for example, on the gender mm. issue, then women are having a better time mm. under Assad than they are under Saudi Arabia. Oh, absolutely. Um, could I then pick up then on, you, you've kind of led us quite neatly to the role of religion. And it seems to me that we're living in an age of political religion and also of religious religion. And that in Nigeria, you could say that there's been a collision between political religion and, and uh, observance. And I heard on the BBC radio they had a, a transmission from a Nigerian church. And the pastor admitted that his, he, this was in the town of Jos, which is right in the, yeah. at the border between uh, Muslim mm. and Christian. And he said, yes, my congregation is scanty. And that was because they fear bombs. Yes, Where I... are you with, with what's happening in Africa? Yes, I, I mean, one, one is obviously very deeply distressed, but 
remember, I mean, you know, that it isn't, it isn't these different religions. No. You know, it's the, not the different faiths. That's why I made a distinction between political yeah. religion, yeah. which I would describe as very present, very present in the United States. We saw them raw in tooth and claw outside the Supreme Court trying to overturn uh, Obama's health care bill, and we see political Islam uh, trying to kill off yeah. Christian yeah. Uh, religion in, in Nigeria. Yeah, but I mean, not too far away. I mean, Ireland, Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. I mean, it was people who claimed to belong to the same faith using, mm -hmm. using that as a reason for clobbering others. And, and I mean, we Christians particularly ought to be a great deal more modest but again, that was political religion, you know, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, what you want to say is don't because certain Muslims behave in a particular way then say, therefore, Islam is. Oh, no, because in Joss, for example, they visited the local mosque and talked talk to the mullah who was yeah. absolutely horrified at what was going on yeah. but had no power to influence it. Yes, I mean, I hope we, we had... We, Kofi, just before he, he stepped down, uh, called a group um, of about 30 people, uh, and it was called the Alliance of Civilizations, with people of different faiths and from different countries and, and gender. Uh, and amazingly, this disparate group produced a unanimous report, uh, and summing it up, Coffee said, it isn't the faiths that are the problem. It is the faithful. <laughs> and faithful. I mean, we've had a party not enforced on us by pagans, but Christians. You know, and, and we've, we've, we've got to realize that, I mean, when people are on a kind of binge, they are going to use anything to try to justify. And well, I mean, what could you, as an elder, do in Nigeria? Could you go to a place like Joss and say, what? You know, I mean, they'd come and kill you. Uh, well, I, I mean, we've been to places uh, like that, I mean, and, and tried to say to people, uh, you know, Peace is better than war. Uh, it is much better for you if you cooperate rather than clobber each other. We did it in, in Northern Ireland uh, as well. I mean, and uh, yeah. You, I, I often say I'm so glad I'm not God. <laughs> Because, I mean, just imagine what God must feel like. I mean, we, we, each one of them says, I'm doing God's work. Hmm. And, and, and they go off on a binge to clobber others in the name of religion. And you've got to try to persuade them that it's not going to work that way. I've just remembered that it's your 67th wedding anniversary. 57. Do you think God's forgiven no, you being a wife? 50. 57th. 57. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and your wife, Leah, is somewhere on the road between Soweto and, uh, and, and somewhere. That's the, that's the best way of celebrating a, a, a wedding anniversary. What, to be three and a half thousand miles? No, it's now. awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, 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 I'm sorry not to be with her, but she, she was very generous. And, and we're only four days away from your 61st? 66. 66th <laughs> wedding anniversary. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know that you have any comment on political religion in, in America um, and, and whether there's any affinity with political religion anywhere else. But, I mean, what's so interesting is that you were probably one of the most religious presidents there's been and one of the most devout, uh, and yet uh, nobody could say that you were in remotely a political religionist. 
Well, that's true. I, I have always believed, as my father taught me, to separate church and state. But I saw it meld together during the subsequent administrations. And now it, it plays a major role in, in almost every debate in America. You see the particular religions injected into it. And to go back just one step and very briefly, you know, the first of the elders' uh, concern was how the major religions, including Christianity and Islam, are the origin of the persecution or, uh, or derogation of women's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church won't let a woman be a priest. And the Southern Baptist Convention, from which I withdrew, uh, won't let a woman even teach boys in the seminaries, nor serve as a deacon or, or pastor and so forth. And the Islamic faith, as you know, also in some countries discriminates against women in that, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, a, a woman can't drive an automobile. And I think when, when the rest of the world, maybe in a, a potentially abusive husband, sees that the church ordains this inferiority of women, that justifies abuse of women. So I think, generically speaking, the great religions can do more than anything else if they would correct their ways to let women be completely equal in the eyes of God. And then they, they, therefore, and subsequently, they can be equal in the eyes of men. But I think what a number of us found very worrying in Rio, including Gru and myself, was the fact that in a discussion about sustainable development, the initial text had rightly emphasis on the importance of reproductive health and rights, and rights was removed, which um, was backsliding on both the Cairo conference in 1994 and the Beijing um, conference on Could women. you detect the origin of the removal? Yes, there were a few countries, Costa Rica, um, the European Union didn't come out very strongly, particularly because of Malta. Um, nobody understood. Malta wagged Europe's tail? Uh, Malta wagged Europe's tail on, on this issue. And I think there were probably a few other countries that weren't pushing it either. But the, the point really is that um, for women's groups who've been following this, and language matters very much in this context, it was a step back. Rio was a step back on the World Conference against women, uh, uh, for Women in, in Beijing. There's talk about in, 19, in 2015, um, marking the um, uh, 20th anniversary of um, Beijing, um, and uh, people are saying, maybe we shouldn't, because the text might be worse now. And that's extraordinary in the 21st century, but that is actually a, a real fear. <clears throat> um, I, before we open it up to the audience, which we're going to do momentarily, as I think would be said in, in your country, um, <laughs> before we open it up momentarily to the audience, um, I, I want to come to, to one last, um, and, and, and I would have thought, very present issue, and that is the technolo technology, is technology and war, and the extent to which the human is being removed from the battlefield to originate assassination and killing from a very distant place on a computer screen. Is there anything morally, do you think, different between presence on the battlefield and pushing a button um, 5,000 miles away in the sanctity of, of some northern state? Morally. Not for me. It's all war. Yes, I mean, I, I think uh, to use technology in the fashion that they do. Uh, and, Dr drones and, don't worry you. I'm absolutely appalled, you know, uh, that, that uh, we, 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 we're, we're so casual. You know, I mean, when you think, I mean, that they, they, they can pinpoint and, and assassinate someone. And sometimes it's innocent children, women, old people who become the victims of this. And, and it, I mean, sort of clinically, for me, it's actually worse. I mean, it makes it, makes it worse that we can, we can use an extraordinary gift that God has given us of intelligence for this when we, we could be wanting to use it for things like helping to produce food, helping people to have clean water. Or using the same technology to bombard a cancerous cell. Absolutely. Mm. President Carter. 
Well, I think it, when you depersonalize war on uh, one side of the battle, for instance, if a, a major country can destroy another region from 30,000 feet uh, bombing, where there's no uh, involvement personally of the nation itself or even the pilot other than releasing the bombs with no danger to himself, then the only people who suffer are the ones who are the recipients of the attack. <clears throat> and the same thing happens when you, by remote control, kill people uh, with, a, uh, with a drone. So I think that uh, the major deterrent to war in the past has been that both sides suffer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that if somebody's going to attack others, they realize I might be involved myself, I might have my own child killed. And when, when you move that deterrent, you, you not only depersonalize the combat and remove a deterrent to it, but, but you also reduce the recipients of the attack to subhumanity, uh, as though they are not equal to you in the eyes of God, in the eyes of human beings, in the eyes of international community. So I think that it's a very serious uh, step that we have taken from massive aerial bombing all the way through to uh, the drone attack. As you're the only American president in the last 50 years not to have fired a shot in anger in the course of his presidency, or not had his country fire a short shot in anger, it's no good my asking you whether as president you would have ever used a drone. That's a hard thing to answer, but my, my external opinion of what I would have done is <laughs> that I would not. I would not. But your internal opinion is? Well, you know, I, I don't know what circumstances would have happened when I was president. That's hard to say. But, uh, but we worship the Prince of Peace. And I think one of the major elements of uh, human life should be to do everything you can to promote peace and deter war. So I think yeah. human rights and peace cover the basic thrust of what the elders are about. And I don't think in any of our discussions in the last five years, we have ever departed from that basic principle that the elders, no matter what else happens, in every way we can, sometimes very minimal ways, sometimes a maximum influence, we're going to promote peace and we're going to promote human rights. Of course, that is a fundamental advantage when you land at, uh, uh, in, in Sudan, uh, in Khartoum. Mm, yes. The one thing they can be absolutely certain of is, A, you won't be carrying a Kalashnikov, uh, and B, uh, you won't have access to a nuclear bomb. That's correct. Mm. Or any form of weapon. And you know, the, I think the entire concept of human rights includes yeah. peace, justice, mm. and so mm. forth. Mary? No doubt about that. Yeah, I agree very much with that. In fact, I was very glad that one of the first initiatives of the elders was during the um, 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration. We had a whole year of encouraging uh, the marking of um, that Universal Declaration with a whole lot of organizations, Amnesty, etc., um, on in uh, Every Human Has Rights. But the point that you triggered in my mind is I remember as High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, I was very concerned about the refugees from Kosovo. <coughs> And with a number of my colleagues, I was visiting. And then I went into Serbia. I didn't meet Milosevic. He refused to meet me. I met the foreign minister. And then we were taken under escort of the Serbian authorities to the town of Nish because the mayor of that town had been very much a human rights person. We wanted to get more information from him. And um, we were building a case for the International Criminal Court. And we were stopped because there was bombing ahead of us. And I thought, oh, we'll have to go all the way back to Belgrade now. And they said, no, no, come quickly. And we came to a poor housing estate on the outskirts of Nish where there had been bombing by NATO. And there were cluster bombs on all kinds of levels that children would have been playing. And, and there were a few people were injured. I don't think anybody was killed. And I reported on that and, and criticized NATO. And I got heavily censored. You know, the idea of an official of the United Nations criticizing NATO. And yet, I saw with my yes. own eyes, and right. you know, women, are not, women and children are not collateral damage. I think now with drones and with the technology, as you said, it's, it's more worrying. And it's more worrying in lots of other ways too, invasion of privacy, um, the use of you know, uh, internet. Uh, we are actually, as elders, taking it upon ourselves um, to look at um, the internet and, and privacy issues and human rights. And um, we're not going to be the technical experts, but we are going to keep reminding our world that we do have common values of human rights and of commitment to peace. 
Well, at that point, I, we're going to throw up some light uh, because there are some microphones up in the gods, uh, up here and down here somewhere. Um, maybe we could have some lights on, on, on the audience a bit. Yes, that'd be good. Put, put the heat on you. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's very fetching. There's some nice little pools of light. Um, and there, there's a microphone there, a microphone there, and a microphone there. And basically, anybody you'd like to ask Can our three elders a question, uh, make your way to one of these microphones, upsetting all the people in your row as you go. Um, so there it is. You can see that. And there's a first question up there. So tell us who you are, and off we go. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and want to say hello to Mary Robinson, um, who I used to work for briefly. Um, hearing you speak about a range of issues, I'm curious if, um, if, as the elders, you see common barriers to progress among the different issues, whether it be peace, whether it be sustainable development. Um, for example, I heard Joe Stiglitz the other night talking about how our cognitive frameworks aren't changing fast enough to help us address these issues. So I wanted to ask your opinions. Thank you. Can you repeat, Adam? Mary, she's yours. You start. They, they call uh, uh, I didn't oh. arrange this. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I think what, what, what the question was whether there are common threads of common barriers in the various issues that we address and whether, yeah. you know, and in a way, um, I think... Um, we're in a period of change that we don't fully appreciate. Um, political change, the power in our world is, 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 is changing with the emerging economies and the, and, and, and the, and the uh, shifts that are taking place. Um, we have this urgent need to safeguard our world by having sustainable development and by caring enough about the uh, global warming that could destroy um, our whole um, um, ecosystem of the world. Um, we have a financial system that's broken and is causing huge um, issues of divisiveness. And we certainly don't have the leadership at the moment on those at the political level. In fact, we, we, we seem to have less leadership. It's almost, I think it's, issues have become very complicated. Mm -hmm. And political leaders are only looking six months ahead or four or five years ahead. And many of the things we need to talk about are intergenerational. We need um, the kind of reform, the more egalitarian society. Um, that, you know, to me is essential. And really addressing poverty and... and, and, and I think um, it would be right to say that there's nobody who comes from any country assembled in this room who wouldn't agree with that. Mm. I mean, that mm. besets mm. all of us mm. in every developed country. Mm. I'm less aware mm. of the South, but mm. that rings real, mm. real bells. Let, let's take as many questions mm. as we can in the tie at the top there. Regarding Rio, would you say that adaptation rather than mitigation should be focused upon? And to really address the issues of climate change, do we need to look at the recalcitrance of the US Congress in actually ratifying any treaty which would be passed in the future? So um, he's put a pointed question on the well, end of his... There's no hope, in my opinion, in the near future for the US Congress to approve anything that would dis restrict economic development uh, in preference to a global warming correction. And I believe that the global warming issue is not going to be addressed effectively until we see some examples around the world of, of severe deprivation of suffering uh, where entire nations are affected. Perhaps the first one that's going to be affected is Bolivia. And uh, there they are seeing already drought come. So I, I think in the near future, it would be impossible to get either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, no matter who controls Congress, to take a bold stand to correct the global warming problem. We're going to take three questions at once now. Let's take you, please. Uh, Nick Kenyon. It's uh, Nicholas um, Kenyon who runs this place. <laughs> here, here we are in an art centre. In terms of what you were saying about the search for peace, do you see a role for the arts in releasing creativity and actually helping conflict resolution. Very good. Well, that's number one, and I'll remind you of it in a moment. Second question here. Do you think that peace can be truly viable when economic growth seems to be the dominant force in the world? And the last one up here. I had a question for President Carter, which was, did you find you had more impact and power when you were in presidency or now as part of the elders, and why? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good question, we'll get it out now. <laughs> well, did you have more impact in power as a president or now? 
I really had more impact and power as president, uh, <laughs> although it was not nearly as enjoyable. <laughs> uh, and the, the best part of my life has been the last 30 years, particularly since I've been involved with the elders, because I've worked with other people, and we are more directly involved with individual people who are suffering in the world. But I, I would never have been able to bring about a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt as an elder. But I could use the full power and political influence of my own country to help the t to force the two leaders to come together. And that treaty has lasted now for almost 35 years. So there are a few things I could have done uh, as president, like normalize relations with China that I couldn't do as president. But I think that uh, that's a very good question. And uh, as far as power is concerned, uh, president would be more effective. As far as influence is concerned, I think the collective elders can be more of an influence for peace and human rights than I could be as president. Can you see a role um, for the arts in conflict re resolution? Do you, do you, can you see them playing a, a role that in some way opens opportunities? Speaking uh, from my own experience uh, at home, I mean, when we were struggling against apartheid, oh, absolutely, certainly. I mean, the, the, the arts were, were quite critical. Uh, I mean, you had people who, who, who could, who could criticise uh, the apartheid system quite transiently, uh, but because they were on the stage, and, and the South African government was trying to make out that they were Western, um, that kind of criticism was something that could happen. And, and I mean, we were particularly um, energized by song hmm. Um, hmm. as well. I mean, you know, that uh, singing uh, when you were hurting, uh, say at funerals, um, and, 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 and when you were celebrating. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, yeah, uh, you what have... About, what about um, Baron Boehm's uh, Palestinian-Israeli yes, orchestra? Mm, absolutely. The East-West Levant, mm, or it's called. Yeah. Mm, Probably had it playing here, mm, Nick, mm, without a doubt. Mm. The other thing would be when you stop people going to places that are troublesome. By what means? Did, did you... <laughs> I, I, I'm speaking English. Am I... <laughs> you, are you talking about sporting, sporting fixture, fixtures? Yes, uh, no, no. Sporting um, fixtures. No, 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 no. No. Boycotts. Boycotts, mm. yes. Yes, I mean, it's, it's quite important when you have people who are celebrities in, in the arts mm. saying, no, we are not going to go to South Africa. We are not going to go over there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's, it seems a negative, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, people feel those things often more sharply. And what about peace and its viability in an age when economic growth is God? Yeah. Well, I think I have to add a certain piece about the arts because yeah. um, uh, I'm only married for 41 years, so I'm, very, I'm a very young elder, <laughs> but well, I'm, married to, four, I'm married to a former cartoonist. I thought it was 41 and a half years. <laughs> 41 and a half years. <laughs> but um, uh, cartooning can be a terrific form of, um, you know, just showing up, um, uh, you know, showing up wickedness and showing up um, yeah. buffoonery, and show, et cetera. Well, but actually, I just, just on personal, mm -hmm. you just illustrated something very interesting. To be a really successful elder, you have to have another half that's... It been helps, around a long, long it, it time. It helps greatly, and I think it's, it's actually a feature. That we, I don't think it's necessary, but it certainly is uh, helpful. And also, I mean, you, you, also our spouses You three have 169 years of marriage between you, I estimate. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, one of the nice things is that spouses are very much involved. Yeah. I mean, they, they are with us, and I think it, it does make a difference. But to answer the question here, because it's a good question, um, I think we have to think again about what we mean by growth. And um, at the moment, economic growth is... Um, you know, it's based on consumption, it's based on use of fossil fuels, or maybe now a little bit of renewable energy. And so, uh, you know, 
it's very important that we think a lot about the right to development, which is a very important human right. Uh, we've marked more than 25 years of the Declaration on Right to Development. Equity, right to development, common but differentiated responsibilities are all the things we're thinking about in the context of linking climate and sustainable development. But in Rio, we did, we did hear about the, at least the three pillars of sustainable development, and they are economic development, but not based on fossil fuel, or less and less, um, social sustainability. And that means we should not have millions of young unemployed. We should not have no social floor for those who, are, uh, who need um, a social floor um, for their basic um, d d decency as a family, the basic dignity as a family. And thirdly, environmental sustainability. And so instead of talking about growth now, we need to talk about those three pillars of sustainability. And it would mean a more egalitarian society and a much fairer one. And it would, I believe, help to bring peace. Can I call you Arch? It's your turn. <laughs> yes. No. I, I, I wanted to say, I mean, we didn't get the chance to say this, uh, ex except when Mary was mentioning the youngers. I have to say to, to you that I, I get on a high when I'm with young people. They are incredibly idealistic until they are infected with the cynicisms of oldies like us. But it is, it is you, on, 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 it is on you that we depend. I mean, you say, let us make poverty history. And you mean it. You really want to see a different kind of world. You, you, you're fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I really just wanted to salute you uh, and, and say, if we're going to have any chance of saving our planet and saving humanity, then it's going to be you, 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 you. Uh, and, and, and please, go on dreaming. Go on being idealistic because you are amongst God's best fellow workers. And, and we depend, we depend on you. Please. Uh, an another, another round now. We'll take one from each microphone. One. Um, looking for comments and uh, suggestions or, or directions. Six years after uh, the comprehensive peace agreement and with great international support, South Sudan found itself as an independent country. Twenty years plus after Oslo, the Palestinians have found themselves under what many would call an apartheid state or an apartheid-like state. Thank you. One of our three wrote that in a book and got a lot of stick, but he stood by it. Anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Ma'am. Um, as the women's rights advocate for Human Rights Watch, I definitely need your advice. Um, what do we do when an issue that we know is crucial to women's rights, to women's dignity, to the future of the planet, such as reproductive health, is so stuck that we cannot move forward? How do you think we can push such an issue forward? What are some of the foolproof methods um, that you know exist that we can use for this kind of issue? Thank you very much. And up there. Hi, um, I'd like to talk about Sri Lanka because um, all four of you have raised Sri Lanka and I'd like to thank all four of you for doing so. Um, and particularly to me, Sri Lanka is indicative um, of something which happens quite frequently in the human rights world where if you start talking about human rights in Sri Lanka, you're accused of being an interfering, imperialist, westerner. And I just want to know how we get past the idea that human rights are western. Thank you very much. Good question. How do you deal with uh, an inherent contradiction in the organization you represent? On the one hand, the elders is here to give a voice to the voiceless. And yet, inevitably, you will spend a lot of your time with the rich, the articulate, business leaders, oligarchs, uh, newspaper editors. 
How do you stop yourself being captured by those people? <laughs> Another very good question. <laughs> very good uh, question. Let, let's start at the bottom and work up. Uh, how, how do you, um, you spend your time with... I mean, you, you are vastly respected people uh, f for what you do, but you do have to spend your time, or you do spend a lot of time, with people who are perhaps less sort of motivated in that sense. How, how do you stop them worming away at your psyche? Well, one way that I stay in balance of concerning women's rights is that uh, my wife is a very strong supporter of women's rights, and one way I stay in touch with the young people is I have 18 grandchildren. So they... 18? Uh, 18, yes. I have, as a matter of fact, to be more accurate, I have 12 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. You've got all their names? Yeah, of course I do. I have to do that. <laughs> and, and I think that in a, in a period of, of a lifetime, we tend to spend our time uh, of a pleasant nature with those who basically agree with us on, on, on basic principles of life. And, and there are some very rich people, like Richard Branson, for instance, uh, who agree with us completely on human rights and, and peace and, and equity of distribution of wealth. And there are rich people who have the opposite points of view. I prefer to spend my time with Richard Branson and people like him. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, that all of us elders kind of orient ourselves toward people who, who agree with us on the basic principles that we've described tonight. Mary? Yeah, and also, um, you know, we often come back, as we've said, to Mandela's words, Madiba, and he charged us with the responsibility to listen to those who feel ignored, marginalized, forgotten. And I think, you know, it is something that runs as a thread through our work. Um, where we are out there in the field, we will be in South Sudan. And we'll be with women, we'll be with young people. And we don't just talk to politicians when we go places. And when we were um, in um, Ethiopia, and we were out in the Amhara region, we were in very poor villages, and the same thing in Bihar. Um, so, um, and I think that that, that that is a very important part of, of, of what we do. I would like to respond on the uh, reproductive health. Um, uh, I think it's important that this issue is seen as mainstream to development. Um, and that's a message that we tried to uh, put across both Gru Brundtland and myself very strongly in Rio. I also happen to chair a global leaders council on reproductive health, which includes um, uh, um, Fernando Enrico Cardozo, and also Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, and Joyce Banda, the, the president of Malawi, and a number of others um, who um, see the, the need to to sort of champion it visibly and, and um, with conviction in order that it isn't a taboo subject or a stigmatized subject. And there will be this big conference, this big summit here in London on the 11th of July, in fact, just after we come back from Sudan, and I, I'll be um, present at that. And it is very good that the Gates Foundation is making a huge commitment because it's contradictive in the States at the moment, in the United States. Um, and as I say, it was very disappointing in Rio that we went back on core text on this issue on reproductive rights. But um, the most important thing, I think, is to keep affirming the central role of sexual and reproductive health um, in, for girls, for women, and that also it's, it's relevant to an issue that now comes up more and more. I have a foundation on climate justice. I talk a lot about it, and I get the question, what about population control? And I have to answer as gently as I can and say that's an important issue but the wrong question. It's well, not what, is what about population control. We know what to do, and it doesn't come from the outside as a kind of control. It's educating of girls and women, having health systems that bring down maternal and child deaths, and having reproductive health as part of the um, education of girls and women, and of men and boys, for that matter, as well. Are, are we as happy criticizing oil-rich countries that deny women's rights no, as we are? No to criticize yeah. other countries? This was something I, I was very aware of when I served in the United Nations as High Commissioner for Human Rights. We have double standards. We have you know, those who are uh, too important to us for oil reasons or for strategic reasons, and we don't want to um, criticize them as much. There's in a fairness, very interesting development on, on the Olympics. I mean, uh, you know, South Africa was banned in 1963 or 4 uh, because it discriminated mm -hmm. racially. Uh, Saudi Arabia is saying it may be able to get a horsewoman hmm. uh, to, 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 to ride, and that will be their women's uh, Olympic team. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem that the no. International Olympic Committee is prepared to look at the genuine access which has been denied to hmm. women athletes in hmm. Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's a big issue, and 
Um, I think the, uh, sorry, I've lost the thread of thought now. I've just, I had that image of the woman on the horse. Yes, well, <laughs> I, I, she was born in Ohio, by the way. That but proves, I, uh, that proves I am an elder, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me, I want to ask you the other very big question that was asked. I mean, there, there, there oh, I are two, wanted, two big questions. I, I wanted to talk about women. You want to talk about women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it, all, it seems a little facetious, but it isn't. I am actually quite serious. Uh, when I, I... I mean, my own particular theory is most women would be people who bring to life and nurture and that when they are truly feminine they are, they are hardly likely to be warmongers that a, a, a woman who's carried a, a baby for nine months in a womb is not likely to want to see the child being cannon fodder. And uh, quite seriously, I have suggested that we did in fact want a revolution that women ought to be saying to us men, we, we have allowed you. The world is in a mess. J just get out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, people think, I mean, that one is not being, being serious. But when you think, how did peace come in Liberia? Peace came because women of different faiths came together and said, we are going to pray the devil back to hell. Mm -hmm. And it was largely because of the role that women played that uh, peace came. I'm going to shut up. No, I, it's a good thought to leave ringing in our ears. I'm going the to Liberian leave it. experience yes, is yes, a good thing to yes, leave in our ears for this moment. Yes, I I'm just going want to, to move I'm, you, I want to move you on to one more thing. Yes, all right. And that is yes. the very good question about Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and human rights and how uh, people are allowed to say, well, oh, it's just a, a Western mm -hmm. sort of uh, we, well, infliction. Yeah, in fairness, um, you know, the Human Rights Council did pass that important resolution about Sri Lanka and the elders were very strongly um, supportive and we had a, an op-ed about it and it, it was very important. Now we, we have to follow up on that and... Um, the um, Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights must, um, you know, address the way in which Sri Lanka responds to that resolution. And so there is a, um, it's not the strongest process, but there is a process there, um, which is important. There's also the Universal Periodic Review, which Sri Lanka will come um, before the Council for um, this year. And um, I think it's, it, it's on the record and it has been a very important statement by the Human Rights Council that, um, uh, you know, is at least saying um, Sri Lanka must have the, must implement their own report um, and must go further and must, must have, uh, bring to, uh, prosecute those who have been responsible for the worst um, cases. And they have been terrible cases um, of violations of human rights of the civilian population. Sadly, we're, we're near the end, but what we're going to do is take everybody who's at the microphone now. Hmm? Sorry, we've got Palestinian absolutely question. Palestinian question. The most, so, so very sorry. Thank you very much. Um, stay by the microphones, those who are there now. Don't anybody else join, because I saw the two of you at the back there. I, uh -huh. I saw you. Uh -huh. I, so you can stay, you can stay, we'll try and get everybody in, but don't anybody else join because otherwise we're here till midnight. Um, six years after the peace agreement uh, in South Sudan, 20 years after Oslo, Palestinians are nowhere South Sudan is a state. Well, I think if there's one issue on which the 10 elders have been unanimous, it's on the condemnation of the gross deprivation of human rights among the Palestinians by Israel. And, 
And we've always uh, added the fact that we are, all, we are looking for the benefit to the people of Israel. Because if I have had one dream and one prayer for the last 30 something years is to bring peace to Israel. And I think all the elders agree with this, but the only way you can bring peace to Israel is to have justice and peace for the Palestinians. And that is not being done now. And unfortunately, it's an area where the world powers have backed away. For the first time in the last uh, 45 or 50 years, the United States is playing no role of a positive nature in trying to bring peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And it may be that this is something that will be improved as a situation with the election of a new president in Egypt. Because in the past, the Egyptian president Mubarak has been supporting whatever Israel and the United States said. And I think now this will be a more balanced approach. So the Palestinians are suffering greatly. Israel has taken over Palestinian land. We've been to Israel, we've been to the West Bank, we've been to East Jerusalem, we've been to Gaza, the elders have. We've been to Egypt, we've been to Jordan, we've talked to all these people. And I think of all the organizations on earth that, is try that are trying to take a balanced position and bringing peace to Israel and the Palestinians, it is the elders. And, and I hope that we'll continue with our, with our courageous stand on that. And, and the Archbishop has been in the forefront of wanting, for instance, to... Uh, to do something there. I have also, Mary has also. In fact, unanimously, we see this as one of the great uh, omissions in the commitment of Europeans and Americans and others to bring peace to a troubled area of the world. Right, let's take, uh, everybody's at the microphone, I'll take you two first. Yeah, hi, my question would be for President Carter. Um, you have um, underlined the sacrosanctity of uh, the elections and how we should, in fact, in, in, in the case of Egypt, and how we should, in fact, not only acknowledge it, but, but support it very rightfully. And my question is, how would you reconcile this concept, very important pillar uh, concept, with the results in Aceh, which you, I'm sure you're familiar, is this region in Indonesia, uh, where through democratically elected uh, government, and one that has been actually re-elected a couple of months ago, uh, Sharia has been implemented and very forcefully applied. That was in Niger, did you say? Aceh. In? In Indonesia. Indonesia. Indonesia, sorry. In Aceh. Yeah. In Aceh, yeah. Worth for a journalist to know this fact. Thank you. No, sorry. no, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear through the echo. Ah, sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, and the next question. Thanks. I've had the opportunities to see the elders in action in Rio, in Copenhagen, in many places, and I'd like to thank them for the inspiration they bring to grassroots activists and younger people. However, I want to raise a somewhat controversial issue. Do you think that it's important now for the elders to add the voice to attacking and interrogating the quality of democracy that we actually have in the world? because very many of the countries that claim to be promoters of democracy are actually far too often the underminers of democracy. Uh, the United States today, I would say, is the best democracy money can buy. And the example, that John, the example that John Snow gave about the bankers here in the UK who can engage in billions of dollars of theft and can walk away with bonuses when people to use Jimmy Carter's example, with a joint in the pocket, have to spend time in prison. So should the elders moving forward not begin to actually begin to add some qualitative discussion to what is democracy in the current world that we live in? Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you very much. You five up there. The two interlopers at the back as well, yeah. yeah right. Five pithy questions, please. Okay. Hello. Hiya. Hi. <laughs> um, as young people, we were just wondering, as elders, how you plan to, or if you already do, pass your message on to the next generation, your mantra and your message, on to young people like us and the next generation. Very good. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for your joint appearance. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the next? Hi. Um, I can see there's lots of effort that's been carried out in southern countries. So I would like to know what the elders has been doing with the leaders in uh, northern countries where the leaders have much more power and the influence to 
bring about change and um, and uh, make the world a better place. Very good. And it'd be great if we can give like example where you actually have succeeded in influencing a, a northern president or someone with a great influence. Excellent question. Next. Hi, um, we've heard a lot about women's rights, which is obviously a big issue, but nothing about queer rights. And I was wondering, with such a diverse group of elders, including such religious people, whether LGBTQ plus groups were on your agenda? Gay Did you say gay rights? Gay rights. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, and Hi, um, you say that a key part of the elders' work is achieving justice and human rights. And I wondered if you'd found that law and legal changes had been more or less affected than meeting with leaders on a personal level as respected and important people that you are and making agreements with them as more important. So, uh, in a sense, you're, you're questioning whether um, law and, and legal... Just, just repeat it again. Uh, <laughs> um, whether law and legal changes seem to be more effective in achieving your aims than meeting with leaders on a personal level and trying to reach agreements with them. Very good, very good. And uh, two, two here. A uh, question for Archbishop uh, Joseph Duncan, Tutu Foundation. Um, yeah, a question about Ubuntu. Uh, you know, I've, I've personally been immensely inspired by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the idea of you know, one family and you know, that everybody's, everybody else is brother and sister. Uh, but you know, the culture that I find myself living in just seems to be so you know, pushing me and everybody else towards uh, you know, punitive, uh, you know, uh, bit punishing people and splitting people up and putting people into boxes. And you know, working, wanting to promote you know, the ideas of Ubuntu or community togetherness. It's like, where do we start with culture? You know, where does oppression need to be? Uh, and what can, what can we do as you know, individual citizens? You know, really, to really shift this. What's it going to take? Excellent. And, and the final one up that. Good evening. Um, I wanted to ask, if, uh, if an issue comes up in your own countries of origin for each of you individually, do you feel more or less qualified to, to comment on that and to, to not pass judgment, but to make comments about that? You. And you too. Thank you very much. I run a project called Think Hat Vote where we ask people um, from all backgrounds what the future they choose is for the world and how we can create it. I was wondering what um, an act is from each of you of something that we can do as individuals to create the world that we've been talking about tonight. Very good. Next one. Hi, I, um, I was lucky enough to be with Professor Mohammed Yunus, another elder, last week. And actually, Mary, you gave an address on the video conference. It was a celebration of social business, which is a model I find very compelling. And um, in its extremity of giving no kind of financial gain, I'm sure you're very aware of it, um, seems to me to suggest a big potential paradigm shift in how economics can drive change. I wondered what your opinions of, of it were, and if you think it's a viable solution, especially in the developed world as well as the developing. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, couldn't hear. Yeah, you'll have to repeat the question. Yeah, I'm going to repeat them as we come to them because I've got a. What? Oh, there's another one up there, do you say? No, let's Don't know if it works. No, it does. Fantastic. She sort of stole my question anyway. It was about social business and what you sort of think social business's role can be at removing poverty and alleviating the position of women in society. Very good. That, that ties in nicely with this one here, so we'll come to that in a moment. Um, do you think it's time that the elders began to interrogate the quality of democracy? Uh, you, you, you've appreciated democracy winning in, in Egypt, but in our question has suggested there's a lot of people say they're running a wonderfully democratic situation, uh, and as you put it, the United States has the best democracy money can buy. Uh, should the elders be uh, looking at the quality of uh, democracy and uh, interrogating it a little, given that it, it is such a yardstick by which you make judgments? Well, he also mentioned Indonesia. Uh, I was there personally when Indonesia had their first democratic election in almost 50 years. 
following two uh, dictators. And, and it, was a, it was an honest and fair election. And then we went back five years later for another honest and fair election where the people's voices were heard. And now they have a democracy there that I think is going to be stable. And within that democracy in Aceh and other places, there are problems uh, still existing. But I think that uh, their democracy is good. And uh, I think in Egypt, although we may not like the outcome of the election, uh, this was the expression of the majority of people who went to the polls and voted. And I, and I think that uh, we certainly can look at the quality of, uh, of a democracy. In the United States, with a stupid decision recently made by the Supreme Court that corporations can give unlimited amounts of money, I think it has subverted the basic integrity of our electoral system in America. And, uh, you know, and I think, if, you dis if you distill that statement, that one sentence, it's probably one of the most powerful statements a former United States president has ever made. That is, a, to, to call the Supreme Court decision stupid, is, it, I mean, it was stupid indeed, but, yeah, was, uh, yeah. but to hear it from you is, is <laughs> well, quite... Maybe, quite maybe, other, maybe other people could think of a better way to describe it, but that, that's my best word that I can think of. <laughs> and, and I... Because it has subverted the American system and it's made uh, that enormous amount of money coming in be spent almost entirely on negative advertising where to, where to win an election now, you destroy the reputation and integrity of your opponent. And that negative attitude has divided our people into two opposing and irreconcilable uh, positions in the Congress and other places. So I think, I think basically democracy is, is by far the best system of government because not only if you make a mistake at the beginning, like they may have made in Egypt or we may have made in the United States, it's self-corrective ultimately. If the people can, can have a, a right to say, okay, we've made a mistake, let's correct it in the next election. That's, a, that's the integrity of democracy. So I, I, I'm, I'm completely convinced that when the people express their will, those who go to the polls and vote and choose a leader, the world ought to recognize that leader chosen by the people as legitimate and ought to cooperate and try to make that leader be successful. Uh, Mary Robinson, can you um, point to a moment when the elders confronted a northern country and produced change? You're good at bringing about change in the developing world. What about hammering on the doors of power in the north? I was very interested in that question, and I think it's a, it, it's a very valid one. We have talked about that, actually. We've talked about the importance um, of addressing issues in uh, the developed parts of the world, um, equality issues, um, the role of religion. Yeah. Um, your country comes in for a lot of criticism. But whether we've had an effective point, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I can't think um, in the work that we've been doing that we've um, effectively... Sorry? Yes, Cyprus, yes, um, it, it, Cyprus. to an extent, I mean, we didn't resolve the situation in Cyprus, but the work done there um, did make a difference um, to the two leaders um, uh, um, of the Cypriot and Turkish uh, part of, of, of the... But if I may, just while, I, while, I'm, while I'm answering, because I was also thinking about Kumi Naidu's question about democracy, which um, I agree with everything that, that Jimmy has said, but I think there's something more profound. Um, you know, when you think of those... Um, people who came out into the squares and streets um, of Egypt, of Tunisia, etc., because they were so, um, uh, you know, humiliated and outraged by the form of government that they had. And what they expressed interested me very much, because they wanted human dignity, they wanted work, they wanted responsible government, they wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've, you know, I think we need to go back to what is it um, that it is to be a citizen, it is to, and, and it's, you know, if you look at Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and then you look at our world, it's absolutely not the case, and people don't have that sense of, um, and I, I think that this is where we need to be looking at the, um, the issues that the trade union movement globally is, is raising about a social floor, um, so that no family has children waking up um, you know, uh, hungry. Uh, I mean, the fact that a, mi a billion people in our world today wake up hum hungry every morning out of seven billion, is, is, it's shocking. It's a shocking d disconnect between talking about democracy and talking about and what, what the actual reality is. And then we have the double standards. 
And, and so, um, you know, I, I think that the Occupy movement um, in different parts of the world, and in, you know, including in this country and in Ireland, there was Occupy Dublin and elsewhere in Ireland, and there's still, there's a lot of questioning going on about democracy, and I really welcome this, because um, you're right to me that the United States, I think, is in a particularly bad situation. I call the money being um, thrown into um, buying um, the, the sort of, um, all the, the, the advertising space for politics, that's corrupt. That, that, um, you know, that, that, that unregulated, um, any amount of money, the, the super PACs, is actually a corruption of politics. And yet you don't hear the word corruption being used. You, you said stupid about the Supreme Court. I think it's, it's, it's actually a corruption at the heart of a democratic system when you can have unlimited money um, being, being, um, uh, being used. But it's only one of um, a number of, 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 of issues that we should be thinking about. And I, I, I think, you know, insofar as the elders can gain from this audience this evening, I think we need to take this away and actually John, um, take more time to I'd talk like to about say also, You know, my country, I'm not criticizing my country. We have problems, but we've always in the past been able to correct our problems mm. through the democratic process. And I don't have any doubt that in the future we will correct our major problems. Yeah, mm. I think that's right. Archbishop, um, the Tutu Foundation, a young man from, from, from your grouping, had a question about truth and reconciliation. And he said, um, you know, there is this wonderful desire for Ubuntu, togetherness, uh, and yet he finds himself increasingly put into boxes along with all the other people in the, the community. Uh, what, what's your advice about how you bring together people yeah. who are being, finding themselves driven apart? Yes. Well, I think, I mean, you, you do want to be committed to the fact that we, we are interconnected. You know, I mean, we, we've, we've been trying all sorts of systems, and, 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 you know, God has been saying, hey, do you know that you belong in one family? You are, I mean, there is just one race, the human race, and, and, <laughs> hmm. uh, the cradle of humankind, one place, Africa, we are all Africans. <laughs> No, but it, it's actually quite serious. I had my DNA done the other day. I had 2% African. I'm serious. Yes, I can see it in your complexion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, um, no, no. I, I, I dye my hair white for gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, speaking about this thing of Ubuntu, one of the things that I found so incredibly painful when we went to uh, Israel and we were at mm. a, a checkpoint, was seeing what they were doing to themselves. And, 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 and as I sat there looking, I could, I could, I could see a replay of things that had, had, had happened at home. When, when <laughs> somehow you think you, you are the Makulu bus, you are the big, you are the big bus, and you are eating away at your humanity. And I was looking at these young soldiers and saying, what are they doing to themselves? That they are, they are actually engaging in the process of self-destruction. And, and <laughs> the concern, in fact, I have in, in many ways was to say, yes, I'm concerned about the Palestinians, but I'm also concerned about these dear Israelis, mm -hmm. that they, they may not think so. You know, I mean, when we, when we sat at the, the TRC in, in South Africa, it was quite amazing how person after person who came as a perpetrator, carrying out ghastly policies, found they ended up with something that was eating away at their own humanity. 
And I just hope that one day we will wake up to this fact. Family. And if we are family, how in the name of everything that is good can we ever tolerate spending these billions on instruments of death and destruction when we know a minute, minute fraction of those budgets would ensure that children everywhere had clean water to drink, had enough food to eat. I mean, we, Good. I won't right. speak again. No, 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 no. no. Um, I'm just going to try and tie everything into one final question to you all, uh, because we've overrun hopelessly. Um, and that is, uh, do you uh, believe that changing laws can often be more effective than talking to a whole lot of leaders? Um, do you uh, have a message for the next generation? And finally, uh, and you can choose any one of these, or perm one of three, message for the next generation, the role of law, uh, and there's another very important one I wanted to check, and that is uh, the business, social business, and, and the impact of your fellow elder and the address that he gave our young friend over there. So would you like to start off, Mary? I'm very happy to start off, and I, I think the social business, um, as Muhammad Yunus has and put it forward is in fact a, a, a hugely important addition to how we can do business. Um, it doesn't always have to be the bottom line and um, for profit. And there is a, a huge potential. Um, in fact, um, uh, um, I, I think that um, it's um, an idea, I was going to say, whose time has come in a way, because there are so many different ways in which social business can engage um, people. And that young people are becoming more entrepreneurial. Um, they can become entrepreneurial and put the profits back into um, and just have you know, a, a life that actually is very enjoyable and, and, and very committed. I mean, I think people who give back know that they gain far more than they gave. So being involved in social business and seeing the results of it and seeing how you can build up a community, how you can uh, provide um, uh, work for, for young people because you've put the, um, you, you've, you've put the um, idea of the social dimensions of the business before the bottom line is, is, is hugely satisfying to those involved in it. And I, um, I, I'm glad that, that Eunice is, um, is making uh, great headway with it. And um, if I could just answer the other question, what we can all do, and I think Archie, you've already said this, um, I think we, we do believe as elders that everybody can make a difference and that the world needs people to think in terms of I can make a difference. And it's back to maybe thinking more actively about what, what it is to be a citizen, back to Kumi's question about democracy. But I will take away from um, this, this evening's discussion and what we've heard from the floor is that we need to be thinking more about mm. how we live as good citizens in the 21st century and what we demand of governments. Mm. And there shouldn't be double standards, there shouldn't be the corruption of money. You know, we, and, and above all, as you say, um, the, the, hopefully we will get an arms trade treaty at the end of July, at the end of this month, in fact. Um, uh, Oxfam and others are working very hard on that. And that would be the beginning of sanity when it comes to armaments, which are out of control. I missed one uh, question from your domain, from everybody's domain, gay rights. Yes. Um, well, nobody's been more outspoken on gay rights in African countries than you, Arch. Yes, I. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I, I mean, at the moment, I am sad that in in our church or our communion, the Anglican communion, at a time when there is so much poverty and conflict and mm. disease. What are we spending time on? <laughs> spending time on is is this okay? I mean, is this kosher or halal uh, uh, for for these for this person to love that person? And, and I, as we're coming from where I come, where I was penalized for something about which I could do nothing, my ethnicity, I couldn't possibly keep quiet when people are being persecuted 
for something about which they can do nothing, basically. They, they, they are um, sexual orientation. And, and I couldn't, I mean, I can't, I can't understand, just as a matter of justice. How can we want to clobber somebody? Uh, we say, well, racism is, is evil and, and, and all of that. I think homophobia is too. And your message to the next generation? Well, I've been sitting here thinking that uh, when you look at the um, essence or the theoretical aspect or the philosophy or the theology of moral values of peace and human rights, in general, you would find that uh, the young people agree with that. Not always, but overwhelmingly. And I think the elders, I'm not exaggerating, we all feel that that's the case. The law, however, is written by people who hold public office. Young people don't hold public office. We elders don't hold public office. So how do you get the enormous influence, a tiny influence by the elders, an enormous influence by the public, particularly young people, to concentrate on insisting that my government is going to be for peace and human rights and all of its wonderful elements, equality and, and so forth. That is something that we haven't yet done. And, and I would say that, that this puts the responsibility on people who have a higher authority than a president, and that is a private citizen. And so the young people have that responsibility for the future. And, and, and I, I would hope to imitate or to repeat what Archbishop said a few minutes ago. God knows that the future of the world depends on the young people retaining their idealism and their moral values, their hopes and their dreams. And, and if they don't do it, if they, if they submerge themselves into being affected by the mundane aspects of life, how much can I get at the expense of others and so forth, we won't succeed. But I have confidence, optimism, that in the future we'll see a world of peace and human rights. So that's where you come. But, but how to affect the, the lawmakers that is a big problem that we have to address. We'll do our share as 10 elders, but the vast majority of people in this audience are the ones that are going to shape the future in my country, in Great Britain, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, all over the world. My friends, uh, we have been in on an intoxicating moment in history. <laughs> Three wonderful minds have been gathered before us, taking our questions and exploring the issues of our day. And they've left us with one message that we should each take out of this room. I can make a difference. And if each of us takes that away, we will leave this room collectively more powerful than we entered it. So I'd like on your behalf to thank President Jimmy Carter, former President Mary Robinson, and Arch Archbishop Desmond Tutu. <laughs> Very wonderful.